All right. Well, today is Mother's Day. Did you know that? Hopefully. If not, you may have time to pick up something real quick, some flowers, maybe Ivy has some, I don't know. <laughs> Hopefully you know it's Mother's Day. Uh, and so I thought that today we would look at a story of a mom in the Bible. Now, this story is a story that we might not necessarily be able to pull up on our own. Now, you know, when you hear this story, maybe it sounds familiar, but it's just not one of those stories that you pick out right away when you think of the Bible. You know, this is a story about a woman who's not even named, we don't know her name, and she is, it's a short story, right in the middle of 1 Kings. Usually when you pick up the Bible to read, uh, you're going to maybe, maybe you have a resolution. I'm going to start reading the Bible regularly. You pick up the Bible, you probably don't open the first Kings to start with, right? I mean, there, there's some books that are just more go-to books. First Kings is not one of them, uh, nor Second Kings. But they have some really good stories in them. I mean, they really do. But it's just not what we usually go to. And just kind of right in the middle of First Kings chapter 17 is this rather short, obscure story. And so we're going to talk about this story. This involves a woman who's not named and Elijah. Now, some of us may be unfamiliar with Elijah as well, but he is a prophet in the Old Testament. In fact, he's a major deal in the Old and the New Testaments. Uh, Elijah, uh, during this time, this is the time of the monarchies, so the kings, right? When kings ruled over the two kingdoms, it was the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, Israel was the northern kingdom, Judah was the southern. They were together for a very brief amount of time and then they split. And so during this time, prophets were popular. Now prophets were people who spoke the words of God. So they would speak to, oftentimes they would speak to those who were ruling. And they would give them wisdom from God in knowing what to do, how to govern, what policy, you know, whether or not they should go to war, and things like that. And so prophets were always talking to the ruling class. Usually they, those were the ones that they talked to. And there were different kinds of prophets. Some prophets, of course, were tempted to just say whatever the king wanted to hear, right? I mean, that's easy. Of course, it's tempting. You know, when, if the king wants to know, should we go off and fight these people over here? It's easy enough for the prophet to say, yes, go forth, you will be victorious, right? I mean, that's the patriotic thing to say. It's tempting to just go along with that and be a puppet of the king. And then there are other prophets who would uh, give real wisdom, and they would sometimes say, uh, no, you shouldn't do this. I, I see that if you go forth and fight these people, you're going to have a terrible loss. You're gonna, you yourself are going to die, or you're going to just have a, a terrible loss. That's not the patriotic thing to say. And so the temptation is not to do that. And so rather than telling the truth, some prophets would just say what people wanted to hear. Other prophets would tell them the truth even when it was inconvenient. And they would sometimes hold the ruling class to account, uh, either because they're doing something wrong or maybe they're doing something that wasn't just or right. And so they were known as troublemakers. And Elijah was a troublemaker. Uh, sometimes the kings would literally call them troublemaker, and uh, but they still listened to them. They had it's interesting, even though the prophets sometimes were considered troublemakers, they still had a certain level of respect, and they still wanted to hear from them. Jeremiah was even in prison during some of his time, and yet sometimes the king would still get him out of prison so he could hear his advice, and so. But Elijah was a troublemaker. He lived in the 9th century B.C. in the northern kingdom of Israel during the reign of King Ahab. Now, a lot of different kings, as we read through First and Second Kings, they'll say, they'll summarize the rule of a king. And they'll say, well, this king did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. And maybe they'll, maybe they'll say a thing or two that they did that they thought was right. And then there'll be other kings, they'll say, they did what was wicked in the eyes of the Lord. And sometimes that'll be it. Sometimes they'll say something else. Now, probably for most kings, uh, like today, there's a mixture of, of both, right? I mean, but usually one side kind of overrules them. And they are known most 
for either good or evil. King Ahab is one that was known for uh, being difficult and for not following the way of God. And so Elijah would call him to account many times. And so he was known as troublemaker. Now, Elijah is so major. In fact, it is known, tradition says, that he led a school of prophets, students who were learning how to be prophets. And he was one that his successor was Elisha, and it's always hard for us to keep track of those two, Elijah and Elisha. You think they could make it a little easier. But Elijah, after he died, he was just as popular as when he was alive, if not more so, as there was prophecy that he would return. See, he was taken up into heaven, and so there was a lot of prophecy that said that he would return before Jesus came. Now, when Jesus came, he said John the Baptist fulfilled that role, so it must have been more in spirit or rather than being literal. But they, they believed that Elijah would return. When Jesus was transfigured, uh, there were two people present from the Old Testament, Moses and Elijah. And indeed, when people are trying to figure out who Jesus is, some people say, well, is he Elijah? Is, is has Elijah come back? And so, so there's a lot of, of thought about Elijah in both the Old and New Testaments. So he's a big deal. So in our story, Elijah is told by God to go to this woman. So, so here we meet this woman who is gathering sticks for a meal, and not to eat, but to prepare the meal. And uh, Elijah comes by and asks her for some water. Okay. So she's going to go get a cup of water. And then as she goes, he's like, oh, and uh, how about some bread too? Which is not, I mean, that's not uncommon. He's, he's not being overbearing. But... Most people have bread ready to go. She doesn't. And in her response, you can hear the cynicism. You know, you can hear the cynicism, the sense of the loss of hope in her life as she says, you know, I don't have any bread. Uh, you know, I only have a little bit of flour and oil and I'm gathering these sticks to make this meal for my son and I to eat and then die. Right? So, so that's their last meal. She's going to be out of stuff. She's in dire straits. She's a widow, number one. So her husband has passed away. We don't know how recently that was. If it's been years or if it was recent, I'm going to guess probably recent because she still has a young son, but I, I don't know for sure. But this places her in poverty. Orphans and widows were considered the most vulnerable of society in those days. And so she's a widow, she's a mother, and there's a drought. So it's just one thing after another. And so she's just going to eat this last meal and die. I mean, she doesn't know what else she's going to do. There's nothing left. And so it's almost like she's telling Elijah, oh, you want bread? Yeah, well, don't we all? You know, but, but there isn't enough. And so the persistent and annoying Elijah says, uh, go ahead and give me some water and bread. <laughs> but then he says, that God will make it so that you don't run out. You're not going to run out of stuff when you make it. Now, I don't know if she knew that he was a prophet or not, but she did what he said. And indeed, she did not run out of food. And Elijah ended up staying with them for a long while uh, and never ran out of food. He said she would not run out of food until it rained again. So then some time had passed. And we're not sure how much time has passed. It doesn't say. But then her son gets ill and dies. And now, you know, again, she's cynical, which is not surprising at all. It's like for her, the other shoe is dropped. Okay, I thought we were going to die. Now, miraculously, we have enough food. And then my son dies anyway. You know, what is this? The other shoe is dropped for sure. She blames Elijah. She, she says, you know, have you come to remind God of my sin so that he would punish me? That's faulty thinking, but who of us at one time or another does not think that way? What did I do to deserve this? You know, is it that I might be punished for something? When something bad happens in life, we think that automatically. It's our instinct. Well, what did I do? Because some, you know, we, we think that life works that way. And so it's faulty thinking, but it's natural thinking. But Elijah, of course, we know Elijah didn't cause this. It just happened. But he takes her son upstairs to the bedroom where he stays at, and he prays over him, and his life is returned to him. 
And when his life is returned, she is, her faith is restored in Elijah and in God because first they were provided with food, then her son was brought back to life. And that's the end of the story. That's all we ever really know of this woman. So why share such an obscure story on Mother's Day? Well, we know that uh, even though this story had a happy ending, almost kind of like a fairy tale, you know, that the food is miraculously provided, the sun is brought back to life, and even though this story has a happy ending, we know that not all stories have happy endings. Uh, not even all Bible stories have happy endings like this. And so we know that there are people, you know, this lady, she was not mothering in an ideal situation by far. And many mothers today do not have an ideal situation in their life either. There are many mothers, like this woman in the Bible, who are trying to raise their children by themselves. Or maybe you did, maybe you're, you've raised your children, but you had to do it by yourself. Uh, a number of reasons. It could be because, uh, you know, the husband died early. It could be for some that their husband left them. It could be that they never got married, but the man that they thought that was going to be the one and was going to spend the rest of their life with turned out not to be. And so they're on their own. It could be any number of reasons. Uh, but, you know, single mothers today are still in pretty dire financial circumstances in many cases. It's uh, oftentimes, it's a scenario where the mother can't work because they can't afford daycare. And they can't afford daycare because they can't work. And so it's a vicious cycle. And if they could get a job, it still wouldn't necessarily be enough to be able to afford the daycare. And so... You know, if this were a modern-day Bible story, it would probably be a single mother trying to raise her child or children, doesn't have enough money for rent, and is going to be evicted. You know, it's like one thing after another, just like in the Bible story. But then we have mothers with other challenges as well. We have mothers who have faced the death of their own children, and there's not a miracle worker who's going to bring them back. There are mothers who are seeking to be good mothers for their children, even though they didn't have a good model of motherhood growing up to be able to fall back on to know how to be a good mother. And so maybe they read a book or maybe they look at what so-and-so is doing over here, but they really don't know because they haven't experienced it. But they want to do it. They want to do the best job that they can. Now, I don't... Uh, share these dire situations with you to make you feel bad if you haven't had that type of situation. But it's just to say that some people are going through those things. But all mothers struggle. Right? All mothers struggle. Even if you have a loving spouse, even if you have a decent income, it's hard to know, am I doing a good job? Or uh, maybe I'm doing good, but am I doing good enough? You know, it's, it's easy to second guess. Whether it's your children, whether it's your grandchildren. And I've been told that once you're a parent, your parenting job is never done. Is that right? <laughs> That's what I'm told. I don't know yet. I haven't experienced that yet. But, but I'm told that you're never done. And so whether it's your adult children or your grandchildren, uh, you know, you wonder, am I doing it right? And you can't. It's so easy to second guess and to examine and say, well, what's going on here? Am I doing this correctly? The only thing I can say is there are no perfect parents. Right? There are no perfect parents. Mary and Joseph were not perfect parents for Jesus. They were chosen by God, but they weren't perfect. They made mistakes. They lost track of Jesus and didn't realize it for a couple of days. Okay? So don't feel bad. But... <laughs> They, they're not perfect parents. Your parents weren't perfect. You're not perfect. And your children, if they grow up and have children of their own, they won't be perfect parents either. I hate to tell you this, but mistakes are inevitable. So when they come, give yourself grace for those mistakes. And that, that goes for mothers and fathers. Not, not just mothers, but fathers too. Give yourself grace for the mistakes that you will make. You know, like I said, we always, it's, it's tempting to second guess. There's no manual for raising children. There's lots of books out there. Boy, let me tell you, 
search on uh, online, just search for parenting books or whatever, you will have an endless supply that shows up. And if you read enough of them, you will find that they contradict one another because they have different philosophies and different ideas about how to do things. And uh, that's a good thing. I mean, it's good to have all these resources. And some people would say, well, the Bible is the manual for raising children. Uh, well, not really. I mean, it, it gives us some wisdom. It gives us some principles to live by for sure. But to say that it's a detailed manual for everything to do in every situation with your child is putting expectations upon it that it wasn't meant to have. The Bible will not tell us what to do with our particular child in every situation. And so still, we can read the Bible, and that can be beneficial, and that can help us. And we can read other parenting books, and that can be beneficial, and that can help us. But we're still left with some blanks that we're going to have to fill in, and we're going to have to figure it out. And it's so easy to want to try to figure it all out, isn't it? It's so easy to want to plan what our children are going to be like in 10 years or 20 years, and, and will they be this way or will they be that way? And, and it's so easy to want to try to figure everything out. When we try to do that, planning is good, but when we try to plan things we can't plan, and when we try to control things we can't control, it gets so exhausting. It really does. But if, I think that if there was an overarching principle that we should live by as parents, that we learn in the Bible and that we learn um, just in life is that we should parent by faith. Well, what does that mean? It's really easy to just say, well, fill in, let's fill in a theological word and then just call it that. Say, we'll just do that, you know. Uh, one of my pet peeves, by the way, is when somebody is really struggling with something. This sounds really good, but when somebody's struggling with something, and uh, somebody tells them, well, you just need to lay it at the cross. You just need to put it at the feet of, of Jesus. And the person says, what does that mean? You know, and, you, and it sounds really good. It sounds really religious. You just need to take that. You know, you just need to lay that down. What does that mean? And so <laughs> it sounds really good. And it is good. But sometimes we say that like that's just going to make the problem disappear. So yes, we do want to lay it at the cross, so to speak. In other words, what that means is that we, we come to God in prayer and we realize we're not alone and that we don't and can't figure everything out. And so we have to act in faith knowing that God is with us even though we don't have all the answers, okay? So that doesn't solve our problems necessarily, but it helps give us perspective when we lay it at the cross or we... We come to Jesus and we pray. So it is it is very important. But sometimes when we, people say that we don't understand what that means, it's like, what does that mean? So to parent in faith means that even though we can't necessarily plan everything out, there are times when we just have to try to get through the day. Right? So the woman in our story, she didn't know how it was going to be a year from then. She didn't know how it was going to be 10 years from then or a week from then. In her situation, all she could do was try to get through the day with a little bit of flour, a little bit of oil, and a little bit of faith. And for parents, mothers and fathers, I think it's the same thing. We have to, we can't plan everything out, we can't control everything. And you can apply this in any stage in life. We can't plan everything, we can't orchestrate everything as much as we wish that we could. But sometimes we just have to get through the day with a little bit of flour, a little bit of oil, and a little bit of faith. In other words, we've got to continue on, as, whether it be as parents or grandparents, or whatever your situation is, we've got to continue on with the resources that we have, the abilities and the knowledge that we have, and with faith. And God will be with us. And we don't know exactly how it's going to turn out, but that's okay, because we're not alone. We're not alone. So this Mother's Day, I'll simply close by saying, as I do every year, that we want to be sure to honor the mothers in our lives, in all situations, in all walks of life, whatever their circumstances are, we want to honor mothers, and let's remember to do that not just today, but throughout the year. Amen.